Good morning. Good to see everyone today on this beautiful sunny uh, Sunday morning. We're glad you're with us. Certainly we've had a kind of a damp, dreary weekend, but the Lord has greeted us this morning with this beautiful, gorgeous sunshine. And I understand it's supposed to get up about 70 degrees. I have to turn the air conditioning back on. Um, our prayer this morning, we want to remember uh, those we have on our prayer list. Uh, EC Meadows had uh, uh, stints placed this uh, past Friday. Uh, he is scheduled to go, I think, either tomorrow or Tuesday back to the hospital where he will have a heart valve replacement. And so let's remember him. His wife, Miss Edna, is, is moving along uh, uh, as well as can be expected for someone her age with a, a broken hip, so we're glad that she is improving. Uh, let's remember Roger Minchie. Roger had a heart procedure done this past week at uh, St. Thomas, and I uh, understand he's doing okay. Also, let's remember Deborah Pettigo. This is the sister of Lisa Farley. In addition to our uh, prayer list is Tanya Brooks. Uh, Paul just mentioned a minute ago she has been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, they'll start treatments uh, and procedures on her following the first of the year. So let's, uh, let's remember her in prayer. Uh, others we have on our prayer list, let's continue to remember all those we have on there, particularly this time of the year as we approach the holiday season. It seems to be uh, more difficult for folks who are shut in and those who maybe are living alone now, and we will remember all those folks. Anybody else you'd like for us to remember in prayer today? Miss L Melinda? Okay. Okay, all right, so let's remember Marie Tuck. She's going to be having uh, knee replacement surgery. I know that's something she's uh, been talking about for a long time. Anybody else? All right, now, will you bow with me? Our Father, we're thankful as you have blessed us with this beautiful morning. As we go through this day, this exercise of worship in the next hour, we pray that our worship will be acceptable. It will be from the heart and from the spirit. We pray, Father, that we will glorify and lift your name. Father, be with us during our time of uh, Bible study. We pray that we will open the word and listen to what your word has to teach us. Uh, Father, we pray for those that are sick, and we ask that you be with them. Uh, be with those who have recently undergone surgery. We pray for their recovery. Also, we pray for Brother E.C. as he's going to be having a second surgery uh, in the next couple of days. We pray you would keep him safe and bring him through that procedure well. Be with Marie as she has her knee replacement surgery. And we pray that this will be successful. Her life, uh, quality of life might uh, return. Our Father, we pray that you would bless uh, Miss Brooks and be with her as she is facing uh, a very difficult challenge before her of cancer. Uh, we pray for her doctors, her nurses, her family, and all those who will be attending and helping her in this time. Be with us now as we go through this day. We pray that you would bless us as we go about the planned activities of this day of the Christmas parade and the program tonight. We pray both will be successful. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, now if you have your Bible, open it with me to the book of Matthew chapter 25. And I want to thank uh, Don for filling in for me last week. It's good to have someone that you can call on in, in times when you uh, uh, are gone, and I appreciate Don doing that. I did not, however, talk to Philip or anyone to find out where Don got to. So uh, my, me my next best uh, move probably would be just to pick up where I had left off and, and go from there. I apologize if it's redundant. Uh, if you don't remember it, then that means either I did, he didn't say it or you have such a poor memory you don't remember it. But, you know, there are some things that are worth repeating. And maybe this is the case here. So we're in Matthew 25, 
And we're in this parable where Jesus tells the parable of the three servants who receive their talents. One receives five, another four, and another one. And you're familiar with this uh, parable, obviously. And as we worked our way through it, and we're not quite through this parable yet, but as we are working our way through it, I pointed out to you that uh, there is the responsibility part of this that is given where the master uh, <clears throat> gives to the servants their capability of, uh, of their talent, of, of their ability. One receives five, not because he's worthy of five, but because he has opportunity, he has, he has capacity, he has, uh, he has all that he needs to take care of those five. Uh, somebody says, I wish I had more uh, than what I've got. And the problem with that, the more you got, the more you have to insure and the more you have to take care of. So it becomes a bigger headache. Some people can't take bigger headaches. Uh, there's something to be said for the simple life. Uh, and, and many of us, after we have chased our dreams, find out that the simple life is really the best life to live. So one he gives five, and the other he gives four, and then the one man he gives the one talent. And so each one of us has uh, responsibilities. Each one of us as servants in the kingdom of God are, are responsible for our talent. We're responsible for our opportunities. We're responsible for our capabilities. And there are people here who are five talent people. We have some that are listening, no doubt, are five talent people as well. Maybe there's somebody who's a four talent person, and maybe you're just a one talent person. It doesn't really matter how many talents you have. What matters is, is what do you do with the talents that you do have? And that's the point that's being made here. Uh, there's no argument being made among the five, four, and one about the five getting more than the others. Um, and obviously that's not the point of, of the parable. So there is the responsibility that we have. Each one of us has a bag of responsibility. Now, the second part of this parable we looked at the last time is what we call the reaction. And starting in verse 16, you have the reaction given to the five-talent man. He comes and he says to the Lord, I have, I, you gave me five talents. I'm giving you back five more. And so there's the reaction you have. Um, and in the original language, it's written in such a way as to express enthusiasm, to, to say here's a man who is excited uh, that the master has come. Here's someone who has looked forward to this and someone who's eager to, to give to the Lord his account. Uh, unfortunately for a lot of people, that's not how many people look at the second coming. Most people don't look at the second coming in, a, in, a, in an attitude of excitement, in an attitude of desire, in an attitude of, of longing and looking for him. As a matter of fact, most of us probably honestly dread the moment when the Lord will come. Uh, we may be like the one talent man, and I'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. But the five-talent man comes and he gives five. That is, he gives 100% of what he had. Four-talent man comes and he too gives 100%. Now, again, it's not that <coughs> one, uh, <coughs> you know, gave more talents than the other. That's the, that's the point. What's the point is, is that whatever you have, whether it's five, four, or one, or if you're two or three or whatever it might be, it is that you take advantage of your opportunity, you take advantage of your talent, and you use it uh, for the credit and for the glory of the Lord. And so that's what the five-talent man does, and that's what the four-talent man does. They, uh, they tell the Lord that they have uh, done these things. So you have that. And then the third thing we have here in the parable is the reckoning. And, of course, uh, uh, I'm sure I'm spelling that right or not. I don't think I did. Um, 
the reckoning here. Um, it's our no oh there oh goes here in the end. <laughs> uh, the reckoning here, of course, is in verse 19. In verse 19, it says, After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. So he comes, he opens the books, and there he looks to see what has been done, what's been accomplished. Uh, and that certainly will be the case for us as well. Uh, the Bible tells us, Paul in his writing tells us, the day will come when the Lord will open the books and, and we will give an account of the things that are written therein. And, of course, there's the book of judgment, and then there's the book of life, uh, talked about in the book of Revelation. Uh, but those books will be open. Now, what happened at this reckoning takes place in verse 20 and following. It says, The man who had received five bags of gold brought other five. Master, he said, You entrusted me with five bags. See, I have gained five more. And his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been uh, faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, as we looked at this last time, the best of my recollection, I told you that the words well done there in the Greek are really just two letters. Uh, and those two letters there are... Uh, 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 letters uh, that I guess the best way to translate it would be with the word excellent. Um, well done uh, seems to imply that your reward is, is uh, and what God is going to give you in heaven is, uh, is works oriented. Uh, Grace is kind of left out of the picture, if you will, with the idea of well done. You, you follow what I'm saying? I'm not saying that you shouldn't be doing what you can to be a well done servant. What I am saying, though, is, is that we need to also take into account at judgment, doesn't matter how much you've done, doesn't matter how well you've done, you're still going to only be saved by the grace of God, right? And so, and so that's, that's what I'm trying to get at here. With, these, uh, with this word here uh, in the Greek, that, that's what's implied. But it's translated in the English as well done. Uh, not a, comp a comment on what he actually did, but it's actually a comment on the kind of character of the person that he is. That, that's really what's being said here. And so he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. Now I will put you in charge of many things. And so uh, these two servants who have given their full return for what they were given by the Lord. And by the way, if you'll notice, he says here in verse 20, the, the servant does, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. It's the way this translation reads. Uh, does not give credit to himself in any way. He does not pat himself on the back and say, you know what, I started out with this. And now I've gained and I've doubled. I've done pretty well. Uh, he acknowledges that what he has has all of its source in God himself. And so that certainly shows you the kind of character of the person that he is. And so you have these two servants here who are called good and faithful servants. Now the one talent man down in verse 24 uh, doesn't make a return. He goes out and hides his. Now, I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get there. But you're seeing a, a distinguishing mark between these servants, um, the two servants who were um, spending their time um, working for the Lord for the sake of the Master. And then you have the one talent man who was doing just exactly what he wanted to do. And so... Uh, that, that is taken to account there. Now, verse 24, he calls himself a servant uh, of the Lord. Then the man who received one bag of gold came and said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And so he acknowledged himself or recognizes himself as a servant. Well, just because you call yourself a servant doesn't make you one. 
but uh, he, he felt that way himself. So he's really deceiving himself in all of this. Now, this is the person who seems to be the most excusable. Now, notice that it's the one-talent man who was unfaithful. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're a one-talent person, you're going to just naturally be unfaithful. That's not the point. Um, if Jesus had said the five-talent man was the unfaithful one, all of us would respond by saying, well, no wonder he had so many talents, he couldn't do all of it. That's why he was unfaithful. And that would be our response. So Jesus says, look, it's not the five-talent man who's unfaithful here. It's the one-talent man, the man who had the uh, least amount to account for, who had uh, the least responsibility, was the one who became unfaithful. And he was um, inexcusable in his, uh, in his response. Now, every one of us in the kingdom have a responsibility. I don't care who you are, how small you see yourself in the church, or how important you might see yourself in the church, you have a responsibility to the master. You have a responsibility to God uh, and to be a servant of his. Now, verse 20, uh, the man responds, and he says, Lord, I had five talents, Five more I have gained. And there is this element of, of great uh, excitement there. Now, verse 21, the Lord responds by saying, Well done, good and faithful servant. And there are three things that, uh, that he rewards him with here at the reckoning. And so he says, first of all, well done. So you have this verbal commentation. You have the Lord speaking and saying, you've done a good job. You've been a good servant. You've been faithful. And, uh, and so he says to him, there I'm going to put you in charge of many things. I think I mentioned this the last time we were together. There seems to be an implication here that there are degrees of reward. Um, more so than maybe rank. Uh, we might think of this in rank. Here's a man who has five uh, talents he gained five more now he's you know of more importance in the kingdom than somebody else who only has two talents or whatever and that's not the case at all in some ways we're all going to be equal in the kingdom um, John writes in, in first John that we don't know what we shall be but we know this we will be like him so when we're in heaven we're all going to be like like Jesus whatever John meant in that I'm not sure everything but we're all going to have that same degree of, of reward there. But also in heaven there will be areas of responsibilities, areas of service in which we will all differ in. And, and one won't be jealous of the other. One will not be saying, well, you know, I had five talents, but I only got three uh, in heaven now, and, and I should have had five. There's not going to be any way that anybody's going to be able to charge God in any kind of way about unfairness or that we will have any kind of degree of jealousy among ourselves. That sort of thing just simply will not exist in heaven. Now somebody says, how's that going to work out knowing human nature? I don't know. All I know is, is that God can work it out and he will work it out <clears throat> and everybody will be happy. Everybody will be satisfied. Everyone will say God is good and God has done and kept his promise. And, uh, and, and how he does that, I guess, is his business and not mine. If it were mine, it would be a real mess for sure. So, so there are going to be those uh, degrees of reward, if you want to think about it that way, or degrees of service. Heaven's not going to be a place of permanent vacation. Someone asked me a minute ago, did you enjoy your vacation while you were off? And I said, yes, but it sure went by fast, and it always does. Uh, but uh, in heaven, it's not going to be uh, a permanent vacation. It's going to be a time of serving the Lord. You know, as, as Christians, our greatest joy, our, our greatest fulfillment in life ought to be serving God right does that make sense 
You know, as Christians, your greatest joy ought to be serving the Lord. And if that's the case here on earth, how much greater will it be in heaven, right? And so, so you have this uh, expectation where in heaven it's going to be a place where we'll serve the Lord, but it won't be burdensome, it won't be drudgery, it'll be a service of great joy for us. Now, he goes on, he says here, um, you have been faithful over a few things, I'll put you in charge of many things. That's the second element of the reward that we of the reckoning here he talks about. And then the third part of this, he says in verse 21, come and share your master's happiness. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, Tony, would you mind, uh, would you turn over in the, in the overhead here to Hebrews 12 and verse 2 of the passage I want to share? Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Um, we'll be able to share in the Lord's joy, um, in the Lord's happiness. It's not necessarily our happiness that, that we're sharing with the Lord, but rather his happiness sharing with us, which is a far greater degree and depth of happiness than we could ever imagine or hope for. Uh, in, in Hebrews, the Hebrew writer says in chapter 12, in the second verse there, he's talking about the Lord dying on the cross. And he says this, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Now, you see there, he's talking about the joy that the Lord endured. What, what does that mean? When Jesus went to the cross, he didn't go to the cross uh, with an attitude that this is, you know, this is something that I don't want to do. He didn't go to the, the cross saying, I don't want to die for those people. I don't want to have to suffer for or Paul Kirby and Jerry Mercer. I, I don't want to do that. The joy of, of Jesus was to, to endure the suffering and the shame on the cross because this was the will of God and his love for us is expressed in that. You, you get what he's saying there? And so we share in that joy with him. He has a joy uh, of where he... Uh, you know, fulfill the, the, the Father's will, and he endured the suffering and shame on the cross, and we come and we share in that of his. And so it's a much deeper, a much broader, if you will, joy than we could ever imagine. So we'll be happy as the Lord is happy. That, that's what he's saying here. Now he goes on and he says to the man who has two bags the same thing, uh, the man said to him, I gained two more, and, and, and the Lord says, good, well done, and he gives him the same reward. Notice that. Uh, the difference is, is that he has, uh, uh, you know, where he had four talents, now he has eight, as opposed to the man who had five, now he has ten. Now in verse 24 it says, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew you are a hard man. Let me stop right there. He says, I know who you are. He says, I know, I know you're the master. And he says, I know your heart. Now, the man is condemned for two reasons. Number one, he's condemned because he lacks. And number two, because he attacks. That's what he does here. He professes to be a servant, but there's no fruit. There's nothing here. He says that he belongs to the household, but he betrays himself because he's empty-handed, and, he, uh, and he attacks the Lord in the way that he does. And notice what he says, you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So he's attacking the, the master's character here. And he does this, saying, oh, I know what kind of man you are. Now, look, he's not anti-God, he's not an atheist, he's not an antichrist, he's not, not anyone like that. He doesn't want to waste the master's good, uh, or doesn't ma waste the master's goods like the prodigal son did. You remember how the prodigal son went out and wasted his father's living? He doesn't do that. He doesn't embezzle from 
the other servants or from the master like uh, Matthew chapter 18 Jesus talks about the parable there what does he do well, he doesn't do anything he does nothing and so he illustrates perfectly the man who wastes the opportunity that he had now I want you to see the attack that he makes here notice it says here you are a hard man Sclerose is, is the Greek word here. Sclerose, hard. Sclerosis, you ever heard of it? Sclerosis of the arteries, what's that? Hardening of the arteries. That's where we get that word. It comes from this word. What does the word mean? It means to be unbending, to be uh, unmerciful, to be ungracious, to be intolerant, uh, to be someone who is hard. He's someone who lacks compassion. And that's the word that he uses here. I know you are sclerose. You're unmerciful. You're unbending. That's what he says about it. That's how he attacks him. Now, why does he say something like that? He says, I'm afraid. Now, look, most people who misunderstand God are people who are afraid of God. How many of you daddies out there like it when your children are afraid of you? And when they're afraid of you, do they understand your heart? How many of you would say, yeah, yeah, they understand the kind of man I am? No. Most of us, normally speaking, obviously that's not true across the board, but normally speaking, most of us would say, you know, I don't want my children to be afraid of I want them to respect me, but I don't want them to be afraid of me. I want them to love me. That's, that's what we would say. So he says, I know you, and you're a man who is unkind, a man who is hard, a man who is unbending, a man who is ungracious. And so uh, that's how he describes him here. Well, look, he said, boy, I'm glad most people are not like that. Well, I wouldn't say that. How many people do you know right now that aren't Christians, who aren't disciples of Christ because they believe God's a hard God? They believe religion's too hard, right? God's too judgmental. God's not forgiving. And so what do people do? They shy away. They're afraid of God. So you don't embrace that. You're afraid of it. You run from it. And that's, that's what the world thinks. That's what many people today think about God. They think he's too judgmental. They think he's too condemning. He's too hard. And then he goes on and he says this. He says, you, have, uh, you, you harvest, or harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. What does he mean there? I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> what does a person do who gathers other people's crop? What are they doing? Somebody, you find somebody out in your watermelon patch who's not supposed to be out there. What are they doing in your watermelons? Stealing them. That's exactly right. That's what he's accusing his master of. He's saying, you're gathering other people's crops. You're stealing. So at first he calls him, you know, a hard-hearted God, and then he calls him a God who steals. Stealing other people's crops. Well, those are two things that, that he uh, does. Now, let me ask you, what kind of God do you know? If you have give, had to give a characterization of God, would it include this? I hope not. Everybody who knows God, do you know anybody who knows God who would say this of God? Not really. 
Not if they know God, they would never say that about God, right? Now, he doesn't really know God. He doesn't know the master at all. What's he doing? He's pretending. That's what he's doing. He's pretending he's a servant. The problem is he didn't take advantage of the opportunity he had because he didn't want his master to get the benefit of it. That's basically the problem. He didn't want his master to get the benefit of his service for the work that he was going to do. Now, verse 25, he says, So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. And in the Greek, it's very condemning here, the comment that he makes. It's yours, take it, go. That's kind of the attitude that he has here. And so probably meant what he was trying to say was, if I took it and invested it, then I might lose it. And if I lost it in an investment, I'd be punished. And if I invested it and gained, I'd still lose because you'd get it. So either way, I'm going to lose in this deal. That's probably what he's saying here in that statement that he makes. Now look at how the Lord responds in verse 26. You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not uh, scattered seed. Now, in the Greek, the way it reads is, so you think, and I'm a hard man. So you say that I'm somebody who takes other people's crops. Uh, that's, that's how it reads in the Greek. Now, he calls him a wicked and lazy servant. Now, he didn't say, you poor, misguided fellow. I wish you had a better understanding of what kind of man I really am. He doesn't do that. He simply calls him out and calls him a wicked and lazy servant. Why? Because he's part of the community. He was a servant. He had opportunity to know the Lord uh, and to know him well but he's called wicked and lazy. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting in the Bible how you can take those two phrases and they're found together so often in Scripture, especially the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is full of comments and statements about somebody being wicked and lazy. That's how it's grouped together. And, and so that's how the Lord does here. He calls him a wicked and a lazy servant. And if you knew then what you should have done was taken what I gave to you and give it to the money exchangers. Now, the, the idea of the money exchangers here, my translation says, verse 27, I put my money on deposit at the bank uh, so I could get a reward or get a return on it. So what he was saying there is, if you really believed that I was a hard-hearted guy, if you really believe I was a thief that took other people's crops, then why didn't you take it and at least gain some interest in it and bring that to me? So what he's saying is you're a liar. What you're saying is a lie. Now, let me ask you a question. Would it have been a lot easier to go by the bank and sign a piece of paper and give them the money and say, I'll gain interest until the master comes home than it would have been to go out and find a hole and dig it? I mean, think about that. Labor-wise, it would have been a lot easier, right? So, so the master calls his hand here, and he says, look, you're a liar. The truth is that you don't care. You don't care about me. Uh, you didn't care about your opportunity and the talent that you have. And so he's saying here, your excuse just won't hold water. And you didn't hide it in the ground because you're afraid of me. You're hid it in the ground because you're wicked and you're too lazy to care. Now, that brings us to the fourth point here, and that is the reward. So here's the reward now that comes. Verse 29 is the principle. 
Let's back up verse 28. So take the bag of gold from him, give it to the man, give it to the one who has ten bags. And now somebody says, why didn't he give it to the guy who only had eight? I don't know. <laughs> I have no answer. All I can tell you is, is the more faithful you are, the more you'll receive. That's what the Bible teaches. Uh, verse 29, for whoever will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And so there's the principle. That re principle is repeated several times in Scripture. So it, it was something that was quite common in those days that people knew and understood. And what the Lord's saying is the one who uses their talents, they use their opportunities, those people will be given more opportunities, uh, more reward. So what happened to the servant? Verse 30, throw that worthless servant outside in the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, look at that statement carefully. Somebody says, well, the wicked servant here was never really a Christian to start with. Well, yes, he was. He was a servant. Notice that it says here he's a worthless servant, not that he was a phony servant. It doesn't say he was a false servant. It says that he was a worthless servant, an unfaithful servant. Some of you are reading that translation. Who's he talking about? There are people in the kingdom, people in the church, who are like this servant. They have talent, they have ability, they have opportunity, but they're too wicked and too lazy to use it. Now what that says to me is, if you've done any work in the kingdom, it takes effort. It takes work. It, t it takes a little strain, sometimes a little sweat, sometimes some time, effort on our part. But there are people sometimes who are just too lazy. All they want to do is sit in the pew. There's no saying that goes back to a song, standing on the promises, when really all we're doing is sitting on the premises. Uh, every Christian, every member of the Lord's church has a responsibility. I don't care who you are. I don't care what kind of excuse you want to throw out. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. None of that matters to God. You have a responsibility in the kingdom. And your responsibility in that kingdom is to take advantage of it and to use the opportunity that you have in the way that God has provided for you to do so. And to say that you don't have an opportunity is to call God a liar. I don't know if I'd want to be in your shoes. So you see, this is a powerful par a parable for us. Um, as we prepare and as we look for the coming of, the, of Christ, we look forward in that way. Um, can't tell up there how much time I got left. Two seconds? A minute? Okay, a minute. All right. Now, here's the next parable that he tells. Well, before I leave this, let me show you one thing here in verse 30. He says, throw the worthless servant outside into the darkness. Um, somebody asked the question, how can you have fire and darkness at the same time? Those are, well, what I'd call an oxymoron. Um, what the Bible does is that it uses human language in terms to describe for us things that we've never seen. And so in things that we've never seen, like hell, for example, what well, none of us have seen hell. Some of us will experience it, but we've not seen it. Uh, how does God want to describe that to us? He often describes it as darkness, eternal darkness. Now, why darkness? Well, God calls himself light, right? God is light. Now, I want you to think about this. Has there ever been a day, I don't care whether you're a believer or, or not a believer. If you're listening on the radio, well, you can't now because I've just been cut off. But if you're somebody who, from the day you were born until this very day, I don't care whether you believe in God or not, God has always been a part of your life. Either directly or indirectly, God's always been a part of your life. Now, none of us have ever experienced a moment without God. But hell will be that. 
Somebody says, what's hell like, Jerry? Hell is where God is not there. That's what real hell is. Real hell is without, is without the presence of God. That's what darkness is. All right, we'll stop there. I'll pick it next week in the next parable that uh, Jesus tells.